when they ask me where Kane is, I just, I, I just tell them you come up 79 and then you go across 80 and then you just drive into the woods for an hour or so and there it is. So we take a lot of good natured ribbing about living in bear country and living in the wilderness and so forth, but I think there's, a, in some respects, there's a little bit of envy involved in that too. Most people look at, at, at Cain as if it is in the middle of no place. And I really feel it's, it's somewhat the beginning of almost every place. Like Shangri-La, Cain sits in splendid isolation on a hilltop in McKean County, bounded by forest, neglected by railroads, and haunted by the howling winds of snow-swept winters. Cain might appear remote and foreboding to an outsider, those who live here know better. They know that a stroll through Kane is a journey into the dream of one remarkable man and the history of Kane. The history of Kane is made possible in part by a grant from Hamlin Bank and Trust Company, serving Smithport, Kane, Mount Jewett, Bradford, and Eldred with complete banking services since 1863, member FDIC. Additional funding provided by Kane Screen, Kane Lumber and Fuel, and the Cleland Endowment. Kane is an empty spot on the map in the mid-19th century. I don't know how many states there were in the Union at that point, but just imagine that, that here we are uh, just a few hours from Philadelphia in basically unexplored virgin territory, unsettled, undeveloped, uh, and it was really General Kane then that uh, began that process. John Cleland is president judge of McKean County. He's also a local historian who was reared on stories of the town's founding father, Thomas Leeper Kane. A group of uh, Philadelphia investors had formed the McKean and Elk Land and Improvement Company and owned vast acreage up in this area. And it was through their initiative then that the rail line was opened up uh, as a way to develop the property which they owned. And General Kane came here before the Civil War, before he was a general to lay out the rail line uh, for that uh, group of investors. He came to the region looking for a place to build a railroad, but he found something more, a place to build a community, a community founded on his own lofty ideals. Kane was born in 1822 and raised in the wealth and prominence of Philadelphia society, but he also was a social reformer. As a young man in France, he befriended the philosopher Auguste Comte who had turned a critical eye on human society. Perhaps it was in those formative years that Cain determined to one day turn philosophical principles into a reality, a reality that would one day be enshrined in a uniquely productive and civil little town on a hill. I would describe Cain, I think, as a, as a community where life is lived uh, in, in a manageable scale, a, a place where church and community and family and children are important, where we care about our senior citizens, where we care about uh, the environment that we live in. That caring atmosphere, so apparent in modern day Kane, is one legacy of its founder. In his earlier years in Philadelphia, Thomas Kane was known as a philanthropist. He maintained an orphanage at his own expense. He managed a house of refuge. He helped found the Women's Medical College. He was an advocate for the oppressed, Native Americans, prisoners, and slaves. In 1857, he helped to defuse hostilities between the U.S. government and Mormon settlers in Utah. As a result of that diplomacy, he and Brigham Young became lifelong friends and admirers of one another. Today, a statue of Thomas Leeper Kane stands in the Utah State House in tribute to his role as a peacemaker. Ironically, in his home state, he is better remembered as a warrior. Kane was the first Pennsylvanian to volunteer to fight in President Lincoln's Northern Army. Kane even recruited a band of backwoods marksmen known as the Bucktails for the deer tails they wore in their caps. The Bucktails fought courageously under Kane's leadership. Kane fought in 35 battles of the Civil War, including Gettysburg. His exploits and hardships in battle are still recounted today. Bob Carson is a retired school teacher who has studied Thomas Kane's life, including his military career. He was uh, in command of uh, uh, Union troops, and uh, uh, he was shot in the legs, he was shot in the face 
uh, about uh, at this level blew his teeth out and uh, uh, later, it was said that he grew a beard to hide that scar, and he was shot, he had a pistol shot in the chest. Badly crippled and fatigued, Kane left the battlefield in 1863, but he didn't seek comfort in Philadelphia society. Instead, he took his wife, Elizabeth Denniston Kane, to the land he had grown to love in the wilds of northern Pennsylvania. There, they built their home, which today is simply known as the Old Homestead. But both of them rode horses uh, into Cain. On uh, the uh, saddle of General Cain's horse were his crutches. And on the saddle of Elizabeth Cain's horse were lilacs from the Gray Gardens in Philadelphia. It wasn't just the natural beauty of this untouched wilderness that drew Cain to the area. The cool climate and bracing air eased the pulmonary problems that had plagued him since childhood. On his wooded hilltop, Cain drew the vigor that he would need to turn his vision into a town, and for generations to come, the town of Cain was a breath of fresh air. Cain has had a reputation for years as a haven for people suffering from the effects of ragweed and other allergies. And in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, even into the 1960s, people used to come to Cane in the summer because with the mountain air, they were able to breathe easier. Uh, people used to literally park their car on Fraley Street and sleep in the car because they could get relief. The enticing air may have been one of the few obvious benefits of settling in Kane. In the mid-1860s, it was still so untamed that it was hard to see the forest for the trees. Dennis Driscoll's artwork captures the essence of Kane and the vision that Thomas Kane must have had when he looked at this hill and saw a town. Uh, a lot of towns were, were, were discovered simply because somebody needed a place to park or Someone said they, they had a, a chair and a horse and they needed some place to put them and, and they stopped. And usually it's because there was a there was there was a waterway there. It was a traveling, it was a crossing, and there there were bound to be people that were coming by. Uh, but but Cain was was not uh, where we're located is not one of those crossroads. And it's not something someone would travel to without a great deal of, of concern, a great deal of effort. Thomas Cain started the town with an entrepreneurial spirit to develop the land and its resources, but his vision of what a town should be made it much more than a place to make money. In 1864, the little village that would become the town of Kane got its first industry, railroading. With the completion of the Philadelphia and Erie Rail Line, development began in earnest. The, the railroad was the thing that brought everybody here. Kane really brought everybody here. I think he wanted to be here. And I think the railroad was the way that he figured if he could create a transportation route because there wasn't one, nobody else wanted to come here, uh, only the Indians. This was, again, known as strictly Indian country. And so his real aim was to be here. The railroad just ended up sort of passing through. But the station uh, became sort of the heart of the community because of that. The Cain family of Philadelphia and the other investors of the McKean and Elk Land and Improvement Company built the rail line that became so important to Cain. But once it was built, Cain became important to the railroad as well, because this was the high point on the route from Philadelphia to Erie. The repair and maintenance shops, railroad yards, and roundhouse were built here in Cain. Railroading remained a major industry in Cain until the end of World War II. Ivan Yudovich is a retired railroad worker who recalls the golden age of trains. Now this was the lifeblood of the town. In the early 1900s, in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, there was between 250 and 400 men working at the turntable, at the coal tipple, and the roundhouse. So there was plenty of work for everybody. If work was plentiful, it was also backbreaking. Working on the railroad was not easy. It was really hard. Everything was hard. Uh, the tools were heavy, and the summer was hot. Winters were cold. So it wasn't, it wasn't anything in between there. We used to put in anywhere from 40 to 45, 50 
ties a day. So that was hard work. It's really hard. A side benefit of the railroad was the construction of several hotels to accommodate the passers-by and visitors the trains brought to Kane. Thomas Kane built this hotel and named it the Thompson House. It later became the town's first hospital. This train depot built in the 1880s was the focal point of the town. Today, it's the focus of a major preservation effort. As a museum and cultural center, the train station will soon echo with the steps of travelers through history. Hard to believe today that, that just absolutely everything came through this station. All the news, all, all the goodbyes, all the hellos, all the smiles, all the cries, all the people who, who had left people they had known forever and met people they had never met before. Uh, it comes through those doors. In the mid-1800s, there weren't enough people coming through those doors to suit Thomas Kane, so he turned for advice to his old friend Horace Greeley. The newspaper editor who had exhorted his readers to go west, young man, told Kane to go east all the way across the Atlantic Ocean to Sweden. In Sweden, Greeley promised Kane would find plenty of people who would be willing to move to the United States. Delancey Houston is one of the last direct descendants of Thomas and Elizabeth Kane and takes care of several of the family's holdings. She explains why her great-grandfather encouraged the Swedish migration. They were brought in mainly by the general because he asked his friends who would be the best people to bring in to settle this area. And they said, uh, the Swedish people, they're used to this climate, they're woodworkers, you've got a lot of wood, and they're good people. So that's, he sent out documents in the newspapers over there, and a lot of them came through as indentured servant type of thing, so that they could come over, they had a chance to get over here and work off the passage. Kane sold them farmland and building materials at a reduced price in the belief that immediate sacrifice assures eventual gain. He was not disappointed. The Swedes and the waves of other ethnic groups that followed were hardworking people who took advantage of Kane's most abundant resource, trees. Allegheny is a Native American word meaning endless, and that's how the vast expanse of woodlands that became the Allegheny National Forest must have seemed to the immigrants. They harvested the white pines and hemlocks, ran the logs through sawmills, and rafted the lumber to Pittsburgh where it helped to fuel the nation's rapid growth. Nick Novosel remembers what it was like out in the woods. They had hemlock and pine, that when you went through the woods, you had to have a lantern. That's how dark it was at daytime, see? I hauled about six and a half cord, see? And everything by hand, every piece by hand. You had to have muscle and durability to stay right with it, see? Ed Kajancic was born and lived in one of the many lumber camps that dotted the landscape and has spent most of his life in the forest. He and his brothers were cross-cut champions for many years. I uh, like to think I became a full-fledged worker at age 12 when we were able to pull a cross-cut, uh, split wood, uh, even uh, drive a truck, off-road truck, where you could barely see over the windshield. Uh, it was a background that really uh, uh, gave us some good uh, appreciation of hard work. And we had a lot of fun, even in spite of the fact we didn't have a lot of modern toys, TV, or anything like that. The giant trees felled in the forest surrounding Kane were turned into large structures and small works of art. And today, much of Kane's industry is based on wood products. At Cane Handle, the trees go in one end, and finished tool handles come out the other. At the Holgate Toy Company, master woodworkers craft classic wooden toys for children of all ages to enjoy. The, uh, the history of Holgate uh, Toy Company, Holgate Brothers Company, is just fascinating. Uh, it's, it's a real history lesson. Uh, the original company, Holgate Brothers, had started back in 1789. Uh, when, uh, when the Constitution was signed and George Washington became president. So that's when Cornelius Holgate uh, started making wood products in, uh, in, a, in a colonial village called Roxborough, which is now close to the center city of, of Philadelphia. Then in the late 1800s, Holgate Brothers Company moved to the Kane area to be close to the hardwood forest. 
The Holgate family sold the business after the turn of the century. Mr. Henretta purchased the company, and in 1929 he formed Holgate Toys after meeting Jarvis Rockwell, the brother of famous artist Norman Rockwell. Jarvis was working on Wall Street in New York City and making wooden dollhouses for Macy's department store on the side. Mr. Henretta was also in New York selling wooden handles and other products to Macy's where he met Jarvis and convinced him to move to Kane and design wooden toys for Holgate. The sawmills and tanneries spawned by the lumber industry drew more people to the area, and on his hilltop, General Kane's vision of an ideal town took root. A man far ahead of his time, Kane laid out an orderly grid of streets. He provided for adequate water and gas utility services. He set the moral tone for the town with a prohibition against the sale of alcohol and injunctions against illicit sexual practices, and he set aside land that was strictly for the enjoyment of the townspeople. His original borough plan called for three large parks encompassing several hundred acres. One of those parcels of land, Evergreen Park, remains a favorite recreational area today. Betty Lingle is the president of the local garden club. Not every community has such a great place right in the middle of it that you can walk to, you know, and I think that's had a, large, uh, a, large, a lot to do with the success of it, you know. General Thomas Leeper Kane died in 1883. He is buried here in front of the old Presbyterian church he built, now the Kane Memorial Chapel. The displays inside are a tribute to General Kane and to the dream he set in motion. His sense of community and his business acumen infused those who came after him and contributed to the prosperity that arrived with the discovery of large oil deposits. This period of time in the late 1800s became known in Kane as the oil excitement. People made fortunes in gas and oil, but true to General Kane's philosophy, they channeled their money back into the community, building schools and churches, encouraging local theater productions, enticing new industries such as the glass factories and much of the business district as it still is today. Over the next century, industries faded in and out of Kane. One that survived was Kane Manufacturing, the town's oldest manufacturing facility. The gas and oil business boomed in this area. Today, it is still in the ground, but can be gotten elsewhere for less money. The forests depleted by overlogging in the last century have rebounded remarkably, and modern Kane is the black cherry capital of the world by official proclamation of the U.S. Congress. The character of its people is the common thread woven through Kane's history. General Kane's own family reflected his independent pioneering spirit. Kane's brother, Dr. Elijah Kent Kane, was an Arctic explorer. As a memorial to his short but adventurous life, Kane Crater in the northern region of the moon is named for him. One of Kane's sons, Dr. Evan O'Neill Kane, was a surgeon who stunned the world in 1921 when, at age 60, he removed his own appendix to prove that major surgery could be performed painlessly with local anesthesia. Ten years later, he repaired his own hernia. Kane's wife, Elizabeth, was the first doctor in Kane. It's said that when her husband was wounded and taken prisoner during the Civil War, she talked her way through enemy lines to be at the general's side and nurse him back to health. Then when she came up in this area, she became the doctor out in the middle of nowhere because they came on horseback and it really was nowhere out here. And not only did she tend the people, but she figured out recipes for medicine of something she could gather here. A cast of colorful characters has always brightened the life of this town. One of them was E.H. McCleary, known as the Wolfman. In the 1920s, he had the last remaining Lobo and Buffalo wolves in the U.S. sent to Kane, where he successfully preserved and bred the species. His wolves became a major attraction along Route 6. The civic life of Kane has been documented and frequently promoted by its newspaper, which began publishing in 1894. Every day for more than 100 years, the local happenings and spirit of Kane have been captured in the Republicans' headlines. The Kane Republican is one of the smallest papers in the state of Pennsylvania daily and in the country as well. Kay Pearson is the editor of the Republican. In an era when few towns the size of Kane support a daily newspaper, she understands that the Republican survives because it reflects the vitality of this community. I think the, the longevity is due to the fact that it's, uh, 
it's hard to explain. It's like part of the family. It's part of the day. And th this has become uh, so reinforced to me on a snowy day, for instance, and the papers are late, the phone starts ringing and all of them are nonstop. I have to have my paper. Where's my paper? When is my paper going to get here? I miss my paper. That's what makes it important. If the phone didn't ring and they didn't care, we wouldn't be here. Years ago, the Kane Republicans' mythical weatherman, Charlie Thundercloud, promoting Kane sub-zero winter temperatures, brought the town to national attention. Kane became known as the icebox of Pennsylvania. Kane has also made the most of its short summer. Because of a very limited growing season in Kane, little of the ragweed that grows in the area ever matures, so the pollen count is very low. One Kaneite drew an inspired breath from that fact. Sneeze Days is, is a promotion that was really cooked up by John Cliff, who was editor of the Kane Republican. And he arbitrarily picked August 15th as the start of the Sneeze Day season. And every day the Kane Republican on the front page would print the pollen count for that day. And the count was always zero. Every once in a while it would go to two. And these were the official State Department of Health statistics. So they cooked up a promotion that Harry Schreiber who was the mayor of Kane, the young people in the community would pick ragweed and bring this ragweed in the form of a bouquet to Harry on Sneeze Day as, as a present for him. Uh, then there was a small prize awarded and the, the kids in town literally brought ragweed in by the ton. They had to haul it away in the borough dump trucks. Uh, this went on for years and got tremendous publicity all over the world uh, because of our uh, ragweed pollen count and the effect of the, on the uh, health of people who live here. The weather also had a major effect on Kane in 1985 when a devastating tornado ripped through the area. People turned out in the storm's wake and worked around the clock to clean up, repair, and rebuild. Amazingly, the town was back in business within 36 hours, and the disaster bound residents more than ever. People who hadn't spoken for years renewed old friendships. The people, the place, the past, all of these are sources of civic pride for Canaanites. Just ask Kane's current mayor, a law and order loving man named Jesse James. The people here are fabulous and they've been good to me and, and uh, I've tried to do the best thing for them that I could. And I think it's worked out good and Kane really hasn't changed and that's a plus in small towns in our part of the country today. But Kane was 5,133 in 1930, and I think today it's 5,133. And uh, we still have a nice main street. All the homes are nice and well kept. They're old homes that have been fixed up, and, and uh, you drive around, you don't see any, any bad places. That's the way it is in this Shangri-La of Pennsylvania. People see the good, the strong, the beautiful, and they become part of the story of Kane, adding color and texture to an already rich landscape. Everything we create tells a story about us. And uh, when one sits and paints something, uh, you begin to hear the story that someone had intended to leave behind with that. And in painting it, it it's, it's like you're hearing that story and then you pass it along as well. The story of Kane is painted on a canvas that continually changes with the passage of time. Industries have faded in and out. Generations have come and gone, but the soul of this community is constant. It is the soul of General Kane, the man who built a railroad almost to the clouds, yet never stopped looking higher to find the best in both nature and human nature. Future storytellers will add new chapters. Artists will daub new splashes of color but the story's foundations will remain as solid as the hill on which Thomas Leeper Kane built his town. We've raised four children here, and we have 10 grandchildren, and they're all here. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, there isn't any other town in the country that's as good as Kane. I've lived here my whole life, went to school here. Uh, 
Now I'm married, have three kids, so it's a great place to raise a family. Uh, I went to school in New York City and saw what it's like to live in a big town, and I'm glad I'm back here. You know, every, you know everybody, or just about everybody, and if you don't know them, you know who their grandma is or something. Kane is, uh, what do you have to say, is American at his best. Uh, everything from the crosswalks, no red lights, but crosswalks, where people actually do stop for you. You know everybody, and they, everybody says hi to you on the street. It's just a friendly place to live. The history of Kane was made possible in part by a grant from Hamlin Bank and Trust Company serving Smithport, Kane, Mount Jewett, Bradford, and Eldred with complete banking services since 1863, member FDIC. Additional funding provided by Kane Screen, Kane Lumber and Fuel, and the Cleveland Endowment.